preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. To this very special evening that is part of the Ruth and Oliver Stanton About Women series. Tonight's program is The World of the Geisha and our guests are Arthur Golden and Jody Cobb. This is an exciting series for us here at the Y and at this moment I would like to take the opportunity to thank Ruth Stanton who is in our audience tonight for her generous support of this series. Thank you, Ruth. There you are. <laughs> it's hard to see when you're up here. Our next event in this series is not until January, but it too is quite exciting. It's entitled The Sexual Revolution, 25 Years Later, What Happened? And the moderator is Nancy Friday, and she will be hosting Christy Hefner, Faye Waddleton, and other distinguished panelists. So join us on that evening, that's January 20th. And that's just a glimpse of what we have to come in our About Women series. This week, we have a couple of exciting events that we'd like to invite you to attend. One is Coretta Scott King tomorrow evening. She, as I'm sure you know, is the, uh, the widow of the late Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King. On Thursday evening, our real Pieces series is welcoming Frances McDormand, and she will be interviewed by Annette Insdorf, and we will be viewing the film Fargo. Hmm, come, come. <laughs> and one last note about this week's programming is our Jeff Greenfield series, Sunday evening. His guest will be Nadine Strassen. So please join us this week. Now for this evening. The format this evening will be as follows. Our guests will speak for approximately 40 minutes. First, we will hear from Jody, who will also be showing some of her wonderful slides. After that, they will have a short discussion amongst themselves and then open to questions and answers from the floor. Following the lecture, there will be a book signing in the library. And now on with the program. Arthur Golden. He's the author of, our, of the best-selling Memoirs of a Geisha. He was educated at Harvard, where he received a degree in art history specializing in Japanese art. He continued his Japanese studies and received his MA in English from Boston University. Jody Cobb has been staff photographer at National Geographic magazine since 1978. She was the first woman to be named White House Photographer of the Year and is the author of Geisha, The Life, The Voices, The Art. Right now, would you please join me in welcoming Jody Cobb, who will begin the evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, thanks for coming and for the opportunity for me to be here tonight. Um, by now, probably all of you have read Arthur Golden's wonderful book um, and have experienced the life of a geisha um, inside the mind and the heart, thanks to his remarkable talent. Um, tonight, I'll show you how I experienced it as a photographer um, through the lens of a camera. I first met the geisha um, on the project, on the book project, A Day in the Life of Japan. And that's where 100 photographers from around the world um, go to a country, spread out all over, photograph for 24 hours, and then publish the results in a book. Um, my assignment that day was the geisha. And I photographed two geisha, just sort of parachuted into their world, photographed for 24 hours, and left. Um, I was captivated by the experience and um, uh, really wanted to do more and wanted to, to see more of, of, of their world. Um, I was told um, that no photographer, Western or Japanese, had been that far inside their life before. Um, and even the Japanese um, who were working on the book project um, said that they, they had not quite seen such intimate photographs of the geisha. Um, based on that work, Kodak gave me a grant, and I took a leave of absence from National Geographic to, uh, to do a book. When I started the book uh, project, I had no idea if I would be able to do it. I, I'm not um, an expert on Japanese culture or art, uh, as Arthur Golden is, um, and I don't even speak Japanese. 
It was desperately difficult for me to enter the geisha world. It ended up taking six months over a three-year period to do the work. No one is admitted to their world without a personal invitation. Not even clients, not even to the tea houses and the, and the restaurants where the geisha entertain. Without an introduction, I couldn't go backstage to the dances, and even if I were there one night, it didn't mean that I could, uh, I could go back a second time. I spent countless hours and days waiting for permissions. It was incredibly frustrating, and I was not warmly welcomed at first. But slowly, it all started to come together, geisha by geisha, day by day. For me, it was just an exercise in patience. Two geisha unlocked the door for me. Mayumi, the first, um, liked Americans. She ran a bar and was convinced that she spoke English. <laughs> but really, her only phrases were, what you drinking? And, uh, and then happily, at the end, now take pictures. She became my mentor. She taught me what gifts to give, because you can never go anywhere empty-handed, and how low to bow to the senior geisha. But she taught me other things as well. She told me of her life of self-sacrifice, her struggles to survive during World War II, and how, as a third-generation geisha, she had to turn down offer after offer of marriage in order to support her mother and keep their geisha house afloat. She told me of failed loves and then finally finding the love of her life. He was married, but he agreed to divorce once his children were grown. She said that their chances to marry well, their chances to marry well um, would, and to get a good job would be harmed by um, his marrying someone such as herself. She waited 15 years. And soon they'd spend the rest of their lives together, she said, like the couples in the advertisements, going on holidays and growing old together. But just before that happened, he died of a heart attack. And at age 54, Mayumi's future was sealed. She would probably never leave the geisha world. Yuriko was my other friend. She ran a chaotic geisha house with um, uh, four apprentice geisha, or Maiko, two full-fledged geisha, and two 12-year-old trainees. She'd traveled the world and had hated the image abroad of the Japanese as very stiff and formal workaholics. She wanted to show me the warm side of Japanese life and invited me in. The night before I left, she and I talked till two in the morning. She told me what a hard life she'd lived how her mother had sold her to a hospital when she was eight years old as a virtual slave, how she'd washed patients' bandages under a waterfall, dressed in rags, carrying someone else's baby on her back. She ran away and then tried to kill herself. She was rescued by a child welfare group and then wandered Japan, trying to find work and a place in society. She worked in the clubs and the cabarets of the red light districts, but she was underage and always on the run from the police. Then she ended up in a geisha district in Kyoto and came to see it as a refuge, a safe haven. Yuriko and I were both in tears by the time she told me, most people think of the geisha world as very severe, but for me, compared to the world I had known, this place was heaven. At first I was skeptical of the stories of the children being bought and sold. When you see Japan today incredibly wealthy and spotlessly clean, it's impossible to imagine the poverty that preceded the war. And I did have my Western feminist preconceptions that these were submissive slaves to men or tough businesswomen living off wealthy men, that they were cold-blooded romantics, organized fakes, or just gorgeous fossils. But as I got to know the women behind the masks, I found their essential truth Almost all of the older geisha had entered the geisha world by misfortune and not choice. At the heart of their story was adversity or even tragedy. Most had been sold by destitute parents or abandoned by a husband or born to a prostitute or another geisha. Unable to change the larger culture or their place in it, their triumph was to perfect that place. 
Rising above her humble origins, through discipline and talent, the geisha tried to create a life of beauty. She made herself into the image of the perfect woman, the embodiment of Japanese culture and refinement, a living work of art. That was the source of her pride and her survival. We'll have the slides now. The geisha's lips, for me, symbolize the, um, the, seal, the secrecy of her world. Are you focusing, Arla? Or is that happening here? <laughs> She's doing a little dance. <laughs> a geisha dance. Okay. I'm not doing that, I promise. I think he's working on the autofocus there. Okay, good. Thank you. Changed? Ah. The word geisha means artist or person of talent. But she's not a prostitute in the Western sense. But she is part of the water world, that huge industry that um, caters to Japanese men's sensual desires. She doesn't sell sex per se, but romance and dreams and fantasy. Oh, this focus is a problem. Whoa. There. Okay. Will it will it stay that way now? Okay. The geisha is a living anachronism. There's only about 700 true geisha left in Japan, down from about 80,000 a century ago. Um, only in Kyoto can they pass unnoticed on the street. I was surprised to find out that, um, that most Japanese have never even seen a geisha. Her job is to entertain at the parties that are the business functions of the richest and most powerful men of Japan. She provides conversation, pours the sake, plays music and dances but mostly flatters and flirts and pampers the male ego. And that is a real art form. <laughs> One I've been working on for many years. Cannot, <laughs> cannot make it. <laughs> um, geisha emerged in the pleasure quarters of Japan 250 years ago as entertainers for the courtesans and their customers. Each geisha district has its own dance performances once a year, and it's really the only time that you'll see a geisha in public. She has a hangover. She's moaning about how much her head hurts. The makeup was originated um, um, in the brothels of early Japan uh, to imitate the paleness of noble women. Um, it was once lead-based and caused the early death of many young geisha. Backstage at the dances. They're reading their horoscopes in a magazine. Backstage in Tokyo at the dances.
Mayumi said, a geisha contains her art within her, and because her body has this art, her life is saved. That's the power of art, the salvation of one's soul. These are wigs hanging backstage waiting to be put on. This is a, a, the, all the Maiko together attending a Kabuki conference or, or um, show. Oops, that one's a bit dark. The seasons are very important in the in a geisha's life, in the dances and the kimonos. Mayumi said, "This world is like Hollywood. The smart young girls concentrate on their skills. The dumb ones just look for a man." As in a chorus line, everyone has something different she wants, but the serious ones stay. In the, in the end, art is everything. When they put on the makeup, they just bring their face down to sort of an embryonic uh, um, white paleness, like an egg. This is a Maiko, um, apprentice geisha. Uh, a girl will become a Maiko at about age 16. And then will become a full-fledged geisha at about age 21, from 18 to 21. This is a full-fledged geisha in her prime, one of the most beautiful um, uh, geisha in Gion. It was a surprise to me to find out that the average age of a geisha is now well over 40. But there's always a place in, the, in their world for the older women. Some still perform at 80 years of age in the dances. A geisha said, this is just my business face, not the real me. A geisha on the outside may look very pretty, but inside can be a different story. This world is too difficult for human relationships. You must forget yourself and your true feelings. The elder geisha have built armor around themselves that will never break open. The sad choice of a geisha's life is whether to be a wonderful person in the flower and willow world or a wonderful person in real life. In the past, most women were not educated and after a marriage arranged by her parents, stayed home to raise the children. But the geisha world created a separate community of women known as the flower and willow world. Although most women did not enter the geisha world by choice, it gave them an independent identity, a support system, prestige, and a degree of freedom that was unavailable to most other Japanese women. This is a typical geisha district of Kyoto. Inside sometimes looks more like a college dorm than, than anything else. She's taking a nap. And in the crowded living room, a geisha said, it's hard to live in a geisha house. There are too many of us in one place, and things get out of control. This world is too competitive and filled with jealousies. I have superficial friends, not real ones, and other geisha talk behind my back. But I believe in myself. This is, uh, sock is called a ta tabby. A geisha said, red is erotic. The red under kimono symbolizes the change from girl to woman, and we carefully show a trace at the collar and the hem. The men find it quite sexy. They love the nape of the neck, the ankle, and of course the genital area, but not large breasts. Small ones look better in a kimono. We never found, bound our feet like the Chinese, but men find the sight of a foot in tabby very sensual. And a geisha said that the makeup on the back of the neck 
was meant to mirror the genital area. I don't know. <laughs> you, t you tell me. <laughs> She's meditating. And the onsen or the hot springs geisha, bathing in the hot springs. The seasons, again, play a big uh, part of a, in a geisha's life. In traditional Japan, wives never um, uh, socialized outside the home with their husbands. So the role of a geisha as sort of a party hostess, a social <coughs> hostess, evolved. The geisha said, it's a game we all agree to play. The geisha knows it's a game, and the client knows it's a game. We're buying and selling dreams. Clients come here to forget their daily life. So we drink, and if the client wants us to dance, we dance. And if he wants us to sing, we sing. And we speak of things that have nothing to do with wives. What draws a man to this world? The geisha world is a man's hiding place from the problems of daily life. And the geisha is his ultimate status symbol. A successful man knows his way around the geisha world. He defines himself by his connoisseurship, just as a geisha does by her art. This was a naughty dance they were doing at a, at a club. And this is one of the party games, where the geisha ties the stem of a cherry into a knot with her tongue. And then the client eats the cherry. <laughs> this is another party game, um, a little baseball game, where they do a round of a song, and the loser has to um, remove an article of clothing. Um, of course, the geisha never loses. She's still pulling out hairpins uh, when, when he's down to his last stitch. She's getting tipped. One of the one of the geishas tipping another one. Everybody gets tipped. I got tipped that night. I, I <laughs> made seventy five dollars. Um, that's good. The cost of these parties is enormous. A, a, a party of for five people. I think this one um, in particular uh, cost ten thousand dollars for the one party. Everything about the geisha world is expensive. Um, a kimono can cost from ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars, and up. And a well-dressed geisha will probably have between 30 and 100 kimonos in her closet. <laughs> She's writing in her diary. But Japan is changing fast. A geisha now has to compete with all the other things on offer. Only a dwindling number of aging men um, can now appreciate or afford what she's trained to do. This may be the last generation of true geisha. Mayumi said on my last day in Japan, everyone in the flower and willow world is here for some personal reason. Either she was born into it or there was some suffering at the heart of it. In the past, a daughter would be sent to a geisha house to keep her family from debt or starvation. Just as in Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand today, parents are selling their children. But there, it's mere prostitution, just the selling of bodies. There's no pride for the girls, no skills to call their own, nothing to emerge with. But in the geisha world, the saving grace is that even though you may enter with nothing, you will come out with your own skill, 
your world of art. That's a huge thing you gain. And what I've just said is what you should have as the final thing in your book. And I did. That's all for my part of the program. Thank you. And now we'll welcome, we'll welcome Arthur Golden. And now join me in welcoming Arthur Golden. Thank you. I um, have uh, been out on the road for just about a year now since this uh, book first came out. And uh, Jody and I have done something very much like this uh, only one time before. We're slated to do it again this weekend in Miami. And all I can say is, Jody, I wish I had you with me more often. I think the, uh, her eloquent commentary and these slides, well, you've seen them, uh, are quite striking. Um, it was Jody's intention, and she did it very successfully, to capture this world in uh, images. But it was my hope to capture this world from an earlier generation, and not in images, but in words. Uh, let me tell you a little something about how this book um, came to be. I, uh, it first started in about 1982, while I was living in Japan. And the truth is that at the time it started, uh, I had no idea of it. I um, met a fellow there whose mother was a geisha. And uh, although I knew that fact, to tell the truth, it didn't really interest me that much. What interested me at the time was that his father was a very wealthy businessman. Uh, and I was fascinated by the idea of his growing up on the periphery of what is, in fact, quite a, quite a significant empi empire in Japan. And when I got back to the States a, a year or so later, I became interested in writing fiction, and I started off writing a novel about a fellow whose um, father was a very wealthy businessman. It happened that his mother was also a geisha, but that, as I say, didn't particularly interest me at the time. Uh, well, I worked on this novel for um, five, four or five years, and I wish I could say it went splendidly, uh, but it did not go splendidly. I uh, wanted to cover about 35 years in the life of this fellow, and I got to about page 75, and I was horrified to discover that I was still on day two. I took this as a very bad sign about what length this novel might be. Um, you know, I hadn't yet learned this terribly important thing about writing fiction, which is that um, you can leave things out. I, um, I would get him about four hours into his life on the page and suddenly realize, you know, my God, this guy hasn't even gone to the bathroom yet. <laughs> and I would trot him off to the bathroom and try to make a meaningful scene out of it. In any case, I'm sure you're willing to take my word for it at this point that it didn't go too well. Uh, it was in about 1987 that I began to do research into the character of the mother. And my intention at that time was just to fill in a little bit of a material that I didn't really understand about the nature of her life and what it must have been and its rituals and so on and rhythms and uh, in, in fact what happened was I became fascinated with the subject matter. Um, I've heard it said that a novel can be about one of four things, a character, a, an idea, a story, or a world. And while I had wanted to write a novel about, uh, I would say, maybe a combination of a character and a world, I suddenly found myself so captivated by this world about which I knew nothing at all that I threw out the poor kid and took up with his mother instead. Um, I spent the next three years writing a draft of a novel based uh, uh, on a lot of book learning. I read everything I could find on the subject of Geisha. Jody's book wasn't out at that point. Um, in fact, I'll tell you something candidly. Jody's book almost gave me a heart attack when it did come out because I was down at the Library of Congress doing research, and you know, I'd been working on this novel at that point for nine years and uh, trying to get it right, and I was just doing some sort of last-minute research before beginning to revise the thing and hand it in. When I typed in the subject of Geisha, and up came a book that said, Geisha, Alfred A. Knopf, not yet published. And I thought, well, nobody's going to be interested in my novel now that the, this book has come out on the subject of Geisha. But of course, Jody's book and mine complement each other beautifully, as it turns out. Uh, and I was, once I saw it, um, delighted about it. Um, but in any case, I um, had wanted to write this novel about uh, th five years in the life of an adult geisha shortly after World War II. I was fascinated, really, by the nature of how geisha society had changed in that time, because 
the geisha that you've seen in Jody's slides are, of course, all geisha from the present period. But life in the world of geisha before the war was very different. And uh, the changes were most significant around 1947-48 uh, when geisha came back. That was the period I thought I'd begin this novel. And of course, it was my intention at that time to write it in third person. Um, the reason for that is very simple. I mean, I, you know, look, I'm, I'm not a geisha, right? It's, 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 it was an easy call on my part. Um, Despite that, I should tell you that while I was in Denver not long ago, a woman raised her hand and said, excuse, excuse me, excuse me, is that you on the cover? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I didn't know whether to say that yes, that was me on a good day or it was me on a bad day, but in any case, I knew that this was not what I saw in the mirror when I looked. And uh, for this reason, I thought, as I say, it was a kind of a no-brainer, as they say, and I wrote the book in third person. Well, it was just at the end of three years and 750 pages. I was beginning to revise this, and uh, I got a phone call from a friend in Japan who said that she had found me a geisha in Kyoto, where this novel was set, to interview. Um, Kyoto and Tokyo geisha societies are very different, and I didn't really have much insight into the nature of that world. At least, I had what I thought would be enough to fake my way through this book. Well, I went off and met a woman named Mineko, who was 42 years old and had retired from geisha life several years earlier uh, in order to marry. Uh, geisha can do many things, but they can't marry and remain practicing as geisha. And she had made that decision in her mid-30s, had been an enormously successful geisha in Kyoto. In fact, her virginity had sold for a record amount, which was 100 million yen. I love, you know, this is too big a crowd to do this in, but I love uh, in interviews and things, uh, radio interviews and so on, saying, guess how much? You know, and I get answers like $25,000, which is not an unreasonable guess. It turns out it's closer to $850,000 that her virginity sold for, and I'm sure you can understand why it was that in a gathering like this one time, a young woman in the back of the room piped up after I said that and said, I gave mine away and he was such a jerk. <laughs> which certainly remains the best comment I've heard on the subject. In fact, I stole it, and I've been using it ever since. <laughs> well, I learned a number of fascinating things from Mineko. I had um, made all sorts of assumptions about the geisha world that turned out to be wrong. For example, I had written a scene in which this geisha of mine put on her makeup, but I didn't really know how geisha put on their makeup. So I made it up. I had her paint um, black powder like this down her cheeks and then paint over it with the white powder that geisha wear. And the idea was that if a man should do something during the course of the evening to make her cry, um, she, the tears would wash away the white powder and leave this streak of black, which I would poetically accentuate her emotions in a way that at the time I thought was very geisha-like. Well, it turns out that when I talked to Mineko, there was just this one little problem that I had overlooked, which is that geisha are entertainers. And crying in front of a man is not high on the list of things that you're encouraged to do during the course of the evening. That was the first problem. The second was Mineko took me to a cosmetics shop. She took me all around Gion. She took me to see an apprentice geisha being dressed, for example. Uh, I wasn't permitted to watch her put on her makeup but I, because that was too intimate, but I was able to watch her getting dressed. Um, I know that sounds very odd, but in fact, makeup goes on so low that you kind of take off your dressing robe at one point. And once the dressing begins, you're already wearing what is in fact a fairly decent getup of uh, consisting of an underrobe. So I watched and photographed that process, which was quite remarkable and happened in about four minutes. Um, men are always dressers in the geisha districts because it turns out, actually I didn't know why. I never thought to ask. And I didn't know why until one evening uh, at a reading, I think it was in Minneapolis or someplace, somebody said, a young woman in the back said, well, I've been practicing Japanese dance, an American woman, for uh, a number of years. And if you've ever tried to put on one of these kimono, you'll know exactly why men are dressers. Because the materials are so heavy, and it requires so much strength to pull the obi tight that only a man can do it. So this is a kind of hereditary position, actually, in a lot of families. Um, in any case, uh, she took me to a cosmetics shop. And uh, I saw all this normal stuff. It looked like any cosmetics shop, like you know, Cosmetics Plus or something. But except it also had in it all of this wacky stuff that geisha wear. Um, and I bought, of course, one of everything. And when, I got, when it came time to write this scene, I, I locked the bathroom door. You know. 
And I started off with, a, you start with wax, and I kneaded the wax until it got soft, and as Mineko told me to do, and rubbed it into one side of my face here like that, and then made a paste of that white powder and painted that on top. And it turns out that once this stuff dries, you could pretty much stand in front of a fire hose, and it wouldn't come off. So the t you'd have to cry really hard. I mean, you'd have to really, really cry. So in any case, this was just one trivial example of the things I'd gotten wrong. Um, I, I came home from my 10 days in Japan with a box full of, of little bitty, you know, micro cassette tapes full of our conversations and came to the conclusion that I had no alternative but to throw out my entire first draft and start all over again. So I did. And again, I wrote a draft of a novel focusing on five years in the life of an adult geisha shortly after World War II, once again in third person. And uh, it was at the end of this time that I began to revise that second draft, thinking finally after six years of work, I think I'm done. And this time I did have the historical information and the rituals of a geisha's life and so on more or less right. So I thought, all right, we're done now. And I, I passed it around to some friends who knew about publishing to begin with. And I got back word, gradually, that the manuscript was very dry. Well, the first person who said this, I thought, well, you know, one person, I mean, it's okay. Better if he didn't, but it's okay. But soon I heard what amounted to a kind of a chorus of voices, and at one point somebody said to me, you know, I think you could get this book published, but it would be a very small book. Well, now, I didn't really have a problem with that. I mean, my mantra as I was working on this novel was I just wanted what I called a place at the table, which is to say, I just wanted to get my novel published and struggle the rest of my, earn the right, really, to struggle the rest of my career for some recognition, which is generally what you're in for if you're writing fiction. And I was prepared for that, but I had not meant to write a dry book. The material seemed so interesting to me. I mean, the problem was I figured it, I must have done something hideously wrong if I'd written a book that people found dry. So I decided my first plan of attack was to have a week-long anxiety attack, and I managed that beautifully beautifully. And after that, I went and started scratching my head and trying to figure out what I'd done wrong. And I came to the conclusion that principally there were two things. The first was to having written the novel in third person. Uh, it wasn't so much writing in a third person that was the mistake, but why I had chosen to do so. And that is to say that I'd made the decision to keep my sensibility and her sensibilities completely those two sensibilities completely separate. Um, I thought, well, I'm not a geisha. I can't pretend to be one. I'm not going to try to imagine what the experience of her life was like. But in fact, I think that more than anything else, fiction seeks to make us experience things. And, and all, also, you know, here's my latest theory. It's about two weeks old and still being tested. But I, I think it's a pretty good one, which is that fiction is always about feelings, always. Even novels like Remains of the Day, which are very intellectual novels in a way, they're really about a guy missing the point of his feelings, or the sports writer, or Independence Day, which are also about a guy who has trouble with his feelings. I think it's always about feelings. And this was the one thing I really hadn't included in my first manuscript. At the time, I didn't really know what was wrong, but I knew that I had made the mistake of keeping myself too remote from her world. And at the time I'd begun the novel, it had seemed to me a very exotic and remote world, but I'd spent so much more time studying it than I'd ever imagined I would, that perhaps the gap between us had narrowed, and I thought, all right, it's time for me to put myself into her. Um, I guess I have to say socks, because geisha don't really wear shoes very often. Um, but the second problem was having written the novel in um, uh, focusing on an adult geisha. Because if you're going to write a novel about a world, which is what I intended to do, although you know a good novel should end up, I think, being about more than one of these things, I certainly became more and more interested in the character I was creating as I worked on it. But uh, if you're going to write a novel about a world and you want to tell what this world is like, well, the first time this geisha puts on her makeup, if she's an adult, it's her 5,000th time doing it. It's of no interest at all to her. It doesn't make any difference in the manuscript or in the narrative, I should say. And so you have no choice but to grind things to a halt and deliver a lecture about makeup. And it isn't just makeup, of course. It's every single aspect of life in this world. I think that I hope I'm making it sound worse than it was, but I think that's what made this manuscript seem so dry in part. Uh, whereas if you use a child, well, the first time she puts on her makeup really is the first time she's ever put on her makeup, and you couldn't leave it out of the narrative. Um, well, having made this decision, I went up to my study and I worked for a month or two to find a sort of suitable voice I felt I could rely on to tell the story with, and I set out and got to about page 75 and realized that I'd written myself into a kind of a conundrum because when the novel, when I told the novel in third person, the narrator was always free to step away from the story. 
and annotate things for us because it's a very foreign world. We need somebody there to help us understand what's going on. But if the novel is told in first person and the geisha herself has lived in Kyoto all her life, she can't even know, for example, what we don't know. She wouldn't even know where to annotate, much less how. So I thought about that one for a while and decided that the conclusion was to have her end up in New York City. If she's ended up in New York City and she spent 40 years here and then told the story looking back through the filter of her American experiences and told the story not to a Japanese but to a Westerner, I'd have to put a Westerner somewhere in the book. I was going to put him there to listen to the story so that she could say things like, well, you may not know this, but in Japan we do things this way and we do things that way. So I decided, well, I'll begin with an old-fashioned device, a translator's preface. It is an old-fashioned device in, in a lot of ways. And I was a little worried about that for a moment, but I realized after I thought about it for just a moment that one of my very favorite books is Lolita. And I thought, well, if Nabokov can do it, who am I? <laughs> so I didn't worry about that one too much. It has had a kind of additional, um, I won't say unintended, but an additional result or byproduct of having people think that the story of this geisha is absolutely real. I mean, it is called Memoirs of a Geisha, of course, but it's really just a first-person novel. You know, if I'd called it Sayuri or something, I don't think it would have occurred to anybody that it was a, a memoir as such. Um, but uh, this translator's preface at the beginning, I think, adds to the sense that perhaps there really is a real person. Jakob Harhus, the translator, I, I mean, I, I made up I gave him his name, if, to tell you the truth, because it struck me as a sort of a joke. I mean, Jody mentioned it's true that geisha are not prostitutes. Uh, it's not that simple. But still, it struck me as kind of funny that Harhus sounded so much like whorehouse. And so I named him Jakob Harhus, and I have a friend named Arnie Rusoff. And Arnie said, where are you going to put me in the novel, Arthur? And I said, well, there's no Westerners in the novel, but I did make Jakob Harhus the Arnold Rusoff professor of Japanese history. <laughs> I'll conclude by offering you a very short reading. When I first went out on the road, I dutifully did what uh, I was told I was supposed to do, which is read. These are usually called, well, at bookstores anyway, they're always called readings. And so I read. And uh, I quickly discovered that literate adults, n the sorts of people who come to these things, are literate uh, in part because they grow up having their parents read them to sleep. <laughs> so I stopped reading. <laughs> And I started talking instead. And uh, I, I do want to end with just a very short reading, not long enough, I promise, for you to get into REM sleep. Um, this will take just about four minutes, and it's from the very beginning of the book. One of the discoveries I made when I interviewed Mineko was something I would overlooked completely, was that geisha, at least in Kyoto, are quite superstitious. And when I began to research superstitions um, and Taoism and so on, well, some of the things I came across led to uh, this passage. In our little fishing village of Yoroido, I lived in what I called a tipsy house. It stood near a cliff where the wind off the ocean was always blowing. As a child, it seemed to me as if the ocean had caught a terrible cold, because it was always wheezing and there would be spells when it let out a huge sneeze, which is to say there was a burst of wind with a tremendous spray. I decided our tiny house must have been offended by the ocean sneezing in its face from time to time and took to leaning back because it wanted to get out of the way. Probably it would have collapsed if my father hadn't cut a timber from a wrecked fishing boat to prop up the eaves, which made the house look like a tipsy old man leaning on his crutch. Inside this tipsy house, I lived something of a lopsided life, because from my earliest years, I was very much like my mother, and hardly at all like my father or older sister. My mother said it was because we were made just the same, she and I, and it was true we both had the same peculiar eyes of a sort you almost never see in Japan. Instead of being dark brown like everyone else's, my mother's eyes were a translucent gray, and mine are just the same. When I was very young, I told my mother I thought someone had poked a hole in her eyes and all the ink had drained out, which she thought very funny. The fortune teller said her eyes were so pale because of too much water in her personality, so much that the other four elements were hardly present at all, and this, they explained, was why her features matched so poorly. People in the village often said she ought to have been extremely attractive because her parents had been. Well, a peach has a lovely taste, and so does a mushroom, but you can't put the two together. This was the terrible trick nature had played on her. She had her mother's pouty mouth, 
but her father's angular jaw, which gave the impression of a delicate picture with much too heavy a frame. My mother always said she'd married my father because she had too much water in her personality and he had too much wood in his. People who knew my father understood right away what she was talking about. Water flows from place to place quickly and always finds a crack to spill through. Wood, on the other hand, holds fast to the earth. In my father's case, this was a good thing, for he was a fisherman, and a man with wood in his personality is at ease on the sea. When he wasn't fishing, he sat on the floor in our dark front room, mending a fishing net. And if a fishing net had been a sleeping creature, he wouldn't even have awakened it at the speed he worked. His face was very heavily creased, and into each crease he had tucked some worry or other, so that it wasn't really his own face any longer, but more like a tree that had nests of birds in all the branches. He had to struggle constantly to manage it and always looked worn out from the effort. When I was six or seven, I learned something about my father I'd never known. One day I asked him, Daddy, why are you so old? He hoisted up his eyebrows at this so that they formed little sagging umbrellas over his eyes, and he let out a long breath and shook his head and said, I don't know. When I turned to my mother, she gave me a look, meaning she would answer the question for me another time. The following day, without saying a word, she walked me down the hill toward the village and turned at a path into a graveyard in the woods. She led me to three graves in the corner with three white marker posts much taller than I was. They had stern-looking black characters written top to bottom on them, but I hadn't attended the school in our little village long enough to know where one ended and the next began. My mother pointed to them and said, Natsu, wife of Sakamoto Minoru. Sakamoto Minoru was the name of my father. Died age 24 in the 19th year of Meiji. Then she pointed to the next one, Jin Ichiro, son of Sakamoto Minoru. Died age 6 in the 19th year of Meiji. And to the next one, which was identical except for the name Masao, and the age, which was 3. It took me a while to understand that my father had been married before, a long time ago, and that his whole family had died. I went back to those graves not long afterward and found as I stood there that sadness was a very heavy thing. My body weighed twice what it had only a moment earlier, as if those graves were pulling me down toward them. Well, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, so I gather that we get to have a little conversation, which is kind of fun, because I do have a couple of things I'd love to ask you about. Um, the first one being, I'm curious about how, what struck you about this world of geisha when you went there that you found very different and unexpected from what you might have imagined? Well, I really had, uh, had no preconceptions. Um, I, I had no knowledge at all of geisha before I went there. So it was just every single thing that I learned was something, was something new. Um, it was unexpected that I was going to be in that world. And so just every day it was just uh, trying, trying to find someone who could explain it to me, who would show me, who would invite me somewhere. Now, you're, you're a photographer, so, and yet you also wrote this book. So what about the difference between approaching it in images and approaching it in words? Because that's something... I was thinking about as I started mm. talking. Um, I didn't know I was going to write it till I was finished. Um, I was I interviewed um, the women uh, for hours and hours um, in tapes and in notes, and I thought I would bring them all back and turn them over to a real writer. And um, um, in the end, uh, I realized that nobody really had lived that world as I did, that somebody who went back would not have had the same experiences and it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been as authentic. So I just sort of tried to, I put up like slides in my mind and sort of described the slides, the pictures that I saw and the memories that I had from, uh, from my time there. And then tried to let the geisha speak for themselves. I thought that was, the, that was really the only, the most important thing that I could do. I'm very envious of one of your descriptions actually. It's the one, I don't know if you'll remember it. Um, 
because I don't remember it well enough, but it's about the hair looking like waxed. Oh, the rolling hills and valleys. Waxed rolling hills and valleys with little wildflowers, wildflowers or something yeah. in them. Yeah, I thought that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you one last one about um, being a National Geographic photographer. I mean, am I right in assuming that this was not one of your more exotic uh, assignments? What would an exotic assignment be? <laughs> Well, I just got back. Besides from the, the White House, yeah, I know you're right. you're a White House photographer. <laughs> um, I've I've worked in 50 countries around the world in the last few years. I just got back from Papua New Guinea um, last uh, about three weeks ago, I guess, um, up to the highlands. And in July, I did a uh, safari into Ethiopia, down to the Omo Valley, into the Stone Age uh, people. Um, so this, but but this was a really wonderful project for me because um, it, it seems like my geographic assignments are sort of like skipping stones, you know, that you're, you're doing a, a story on a whole country or something, and so you want to just sort of, uh, the, the chance to go in and really spend time with the people and get to know the people and get to know their thoughts and feelings and, um, and emotions was, was, was really um, a change for me and something I would really like to do more of. Huh. Now can I ask you, <laughs> you I, I heard that uh, Steven Spielberg is making a movie of uh, Memoirs of a Geisha. Yeah, I'll tell How you my little, my little Hollywood thing. Uh, it feels pretty wild, to say the very least. But I'll tell you my little Hollywood uh, story briefly. Um, exactly a year ago, because uh, you know we're going, both of us, to Miami this weekend. And I was just on my way to the Miami Book Fair the night before. I got a phone call from my agent saying that the next morning Columbia Pictures was going to make an offer. So I just bought a cell phone. And I um, went off to uh, Miami and I got off the, uh, I you know, never had a cell phone before, and I got off the <laughs> plane and I, I checked my messages. And it was a message from my agent saying, great news, Columbia Pictures, everything's wonderful. And so I thought this is great. I called my editor to tell her, but she wasn't there, so I left her a message. And uh, I got to, um, I got to uh, the hotel, and I was just signing in when the phone rang, and I answered. It was my editor. I told her. She said, Arthur, that's, that's a fabulous. Dude. I said, well, I'm actually just walking across the lobby of the hotel. She said, oh, I'm really sorry. You know, you've turned into a real asshole. <laughs> I said, well, what did I do? She said, well, you're walking across the lobby of the hotel talking on your cell phone about your movie deal. <laughs> and I had to concede that actually she was right. You know, that was, so I thought, all right, that is my Hollywood moment. I thought, I've had my Hollywood moment. And then in, uh, I live in Boston, you know, but in, uh, in about January, I got a call from the producer saying, Arthur, we want to get you out here for lunch. I mean, you know, I've been invited to Newton for lunch. I've never been invited to LA for lunch. But they sent me this, you know, first class ticket and, you know, you push a little button and the foot rest comes up. And, I mean, it was, I love my publisher. I love my publisher. They do not fly me around first class. In fact, um, I think they would tuck me up into the wheel wells if they could. And the only reason they don't is it's already overstuffed with other writers. But um, so I got to LA and I had, I had lunch, you know, it was, I wasn't sure what I was doing there, but it was fun. And then that night, I went over for dinner to the producer's house. And um, he introduced me. There were about seven people, and one of them was Mike Nichols. Well, I thought, OK, this is definitely the coolest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And this is my Hollywood moment. This is it. Done. Been there. It was fun. Going back home. Then I got a call in April, not on April Fool's Day, when he said, uh, as you mentioned, guess who's going to direct your movie? And I kind of went, because I thought he was wooing Mike Nichols. That was why he said, Steven Spielberg. So my jaw hit the floor so fast, I heard a sonic boom. And in fact, that's what this little dent right here is from. And uh, indeed, it turns out to be true. I, um, I actually had my, my Hollywood moment on Thursday because I did. It was a, that's, that was it, my Hollywood moment. Because I actually went, I went to LA, and I saw the work they're doing on the film. I mean, you know, the little model of the tipsy house. You know, I made this thing up, and there it is. They built it, and it's this little, you know, Got this little, I probably would have made it a little tipsier, but it's pretty good. Uh, and I, that was an astonishing thing to see. And then I had lunch with, uh, with the emperor. You know, I had lunch with, with uh, Spielberg, which was also wild. And, uh, and I have to tell you a fun thing, that after that, 
I went and watched the screen test of the actress he's cast in the role of Sayuri. And she was absolutely fabulous. I couldn't, I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. And uh, really captivating. And she's sitting right there. Uh. <laughs> her name is... Uh, her name is Rika Okamoto. She's from Japan. She's lived in the United States seven years, and she's a dancer with uh, Martha Graham Company. Uh, so anyway, she'll be on the silver screen about this time in the year 2000. Now, I want to ask you um, a question about the differences between writers and photographers and writing and photography. Um, a photographer can take a day off. Can put the cameras can put the cameras down and just relax and and but a novelist has all these characters living in his mind. How do you keep from going mad? <laughs> well, you know, it's a funny thing, but I think there are writers who are more intuitive of the sort of Isabelle Allende type, who really do feel that they're channeling, and they go like candles. That's their ritual to get into the routine of writing. And then there are other writers who are sort of cold-hearted analytical types, and I'm one. You know, I never really have any illusion that the people I'm putting on the page are real. Um, people talk about how the characters run away with them. I mean, for me, I feel like, well, I'm in charge. They're going to do exactly what I tell them to do. You know? And there are times when I can't get it written. I mean, that's what people say, well, she wouldn't marry him, that kind of thing. I mean, what, you, what you find is you try to write it, and it just won't work, so you've got to do something else. But I don't feel like it's the character that dictated it. It was just my shortcoming. You know, and um, I think that the other thing that people very rarely think about if they're not writers is that writers are usually in the story to play a role. I mean, writers, writers play the role of writing the book. I meant to say <laughs> characters are usually in the story to play a role. And instead of feeling that you're living with this family of people, I, for me it seems like I feel as if I'm playing chess, you know, moving the pieces around. Mm -hmm. And my consciousness is, in my consciousness is always, the idea of where a character is in relation to where I want them to be at the end of the day or at the end of the month or at the end of the book. Um, and that's really what it feels like to me. Hmm. More like playing chess. Confirms my feelings that, uh, that the novelists seem to have more control over their material than almost any other artist. Well, certainly than a photographer. Mm. That's slaves true. to, to uh, yeah, machinery whatever, and whatever's out there cameras too. and light and yeah. film and yeah. all, those, all those variables. But you can just absolutely control your universe. That's now, I have another question um, mm. about writing in the voice of a woman and, and sort of living the, that, that feeling. How has that in any way changed your relationships with the women in your life or the women that you know? Well, um, I don't think so um, in the sense that I, um, I suppose that there are you might say, well, I, went, I remember once reading an article in the New York Times that said um, the degree of success of a marriage can be predicted by the femininity of both partners. That the more feminine the man is and the more feminine the woman is, according to certain characteristics that were judged as feminine, such as you like to talk, you like, you, you're willing to discuss your feelings. Um, if my theory about fiction is being about feelings is true, that's why fiction uh, if it's true that women talk about feelings more comfortably than men, which I think is unquestionably true as a general rule, this is why at readings it's almost always women in bookstores that I go to. But um, in any case, I suppose along that scale, I've always been one of the more feminine m men. I mean, I'm happily married, I have two children, but I would rather have a conversation over a hamburger than watch a football game. So I'm not sure that I feel any different now than I did then. And for me, the experience of writing from the point of view of a woman was sort of like sanding something that feels a little rough in the sense that, you know, I would, uh, something would happen to this character in the book and I would have to say to myself, all right, now, how would she respond? How would she feel? I know how I would feel, but it's not about how I would feel. It's about how, how would she feel? And so I'd have an idea and I'd try to write it, but it wouldn't get written somehow. And I'd come up with another one and I'd try that one. And it would go onto the page nicely, but the next day when I read it, it would stick out. And I would have to work on it until when I read over it, it didn't stick out. You know, we've all had the experience of reading a book where one of the characters is just difficult to believe. It's set in the 1890s, say, and there's a 
a plucky 1990s style kind of valley girl in it. And it drives you nuts, you know? And if you notice that sort of thing, well, all you do if you're writing is you go back and you don't let yourself get away with it. And ultimately, if it all seems believable and smooth in its surface and seamless, you've sanded it enough and it's ready to go. And if it hasn't, it needs more work. And I guess that's really what it felt like to me. Um, why don't we open things up to questions? I think we're at that point. I gather that we have about 15 minutes. If you have any questions or comments or, or heckling, I suppose we should <laughs> offer you that option. Go ahead, Jody. You pick the first one. I'll let Arthur handle that one. <laughs> Do geisha have sex with their customers? The easy answer is nothing is ever simple in Japan, which is really quite true. But the more complicated answer, which isn't all that complicated, is that geisha exist along a kind of a continuum. Uh, at the bottom of the continuum are what are called hot springs geisha, onsen geisha, and they are, quite frankly, prostitutes. Um, they, they're not necessarily practiced in any of the geisha's arts. They come to a party, they pour sake, they tell jokes, they play strip poker or the equivalent of it, they get you drunk, and then at the end of the evening their intention is to offer themselves to the men for a price on a one-time basis. Those are prostitutes. At the other end of the continuum are women who, uh, yes, their virginity is sold. That's a sort of a one-time transaction. After that, the question of whether or not they're prostitutes hinges on whether or not you think that a kept mistress is a prostitute because that's kind of the role they play. They're set up by men at a very great cost um, and taken care of sometimes for life. Yes, sex is involved in that, uh, but it's not a transaction one-time sort of basis. No, that's a one-time, the question is, is their virginity sold because they're coming, becoming a kept mistress? Um, Mineko gave me to understand that a so-called mizuage patron, a patron who buys your virginity, uh, that that's a one-time transaction, uh, often at a very great cost, but not necessarily always so. And uh, once it's over, it's over. And then the geisha will go on to live the normal geisha life after that's happened. But you're not supposed to become a geisha. You're not supposed to stop being an apprentice until after you've had Mizuage. Mizuage doesn't happen anymore, I understand, in the world of geisha, but it did in the period in which my novel was set. Um, yes? Um, well, the first question, are there any painters I admire? Um, let me answer that in a sort of a general way by saying that I, I studied art history in college, and I, you know, I love Japanese art, but I, I respond more truthfully. I respond more to Western art. There's something about um, it I find much more passionate, and the same is true of the music. Um, and, uh, you know, I always loved Rembrandt, and I always loved uh, John Singer Sargent, say, and, um, you know, I like the Impressionists so, too, but I'm, I, I think I probably go back to that earlier period a little bit more of, say, the Renaissance. Um, in answer to the second question about Spielberg, will I have any artistic control? Uh, it turns out that when you sell the rights, you really sell the rights. And that's it. You're out of the loop. But happily, um, I was told by, I have a terrific agent and who gave me, who explained to me that the only protection you have is to sell the rights to somebody with integrity. And at one point there was somebody knocking at the door and, and uh, I was told, you don't even want to know the offer on this deal uh, because this is, you don't want this person. But when Columbia Pictures came knocking, she said, this is, this is who you want. And um, I've been kept in the loop. I mean, I, I, the costume designer and set designer came and spent a weekend at my house and we talked about issues and they went on from there to do their work. Um, the reason that I, ha I mentioned I had lunch with, with him, which was wild, uh, but the reason that that happened was because um, I'd been given a copy of the script and it was time to begin discussions about it. Uh, happily, um, I think I, I will be kept in the loop, but he's the one with the ultimate say. 
You're on, Jody. Oh, well, for, I, I wish somebody would buy the movie rights to a photography book, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it'd be a lot of slides coming up there. Yeah. Probably a little bit boring. Somebody, at the, yes. Okay, sure. Um, the first question was about the reason for the declining population of geisha. Did you, did anybody talk to you about that while you were over there? I have a couple of ideas, but let mm -hmm. me turn it over to you first if you have uh, a thought. Well, that there, that there are so many other things on offer now um, that, that it's um, the reasons for it in the uh, culture don't exist as a living, breathing um, reason now for it to, to exist. Um, that it, if it does continue on into the next generation, it'll probably be as a museum culture. Yeah, the economics are certainly a problem. It's terribly expensive, and that's more and more difficult. Also, um, the modern equivalent of, say, the popular geisha in 1920. Uh, you know, back in 1920, women still wore kimono. Geisha wore their kimono in a racy fashion. You know, they draped the collar down in the back of the neck and things like that. Nowadays, you know, it's kind of hard to wear a kimono in a fashion that anybody would call racy. <laughs> and, and, and bar hostesses are the modern day geisha in a certain sense. They're, they don't have the skills of a geisha. They don't have the training, uh, but they're the ones who sit and pour drinks and uh, entertain men and tell jokes. And this is one of the reasons I think why geisha have, have declined because, that, because bar hostesses are more affordable and more common now. And women are becoming educated, and they're choosing mates for themselves in Japan now, which wasn't possible before. And men and women tend to socialize together, too, much more than they ever did. Mm -hmm. And there was another question, but I don't remember it. Oh, a male equivalent of geisha. You know, a funny thing is that the original geisha were men. In the, uh, in the 18th century, the first, maybe it's even 17th century, but I think it's the 18th century, the first people to go into the so-called pleasure quarters, which were mostly where prostitutes uh, were and where the kabuki uh, theater was and so on, were men who went there to entertain at parties by telling stories and these sorts of things. Um, but it very quickly became the provenance of women. Um, there are still, or were men who tell stories still, but there aren't any male geisha except perhaps in a sort of kinky uh, sub-sub-culture that I don't know anything about. There may be that. Um, we're doing okay for, we have a couple more minutes, yes. Is there a, uh, what is the importance of seasons and is there a correlation with superstitions? That's interesting. In Taoism, I have absolutely no doubt there is because in Taoism, Everything's all divided up into quadrants, you know, and no doubt the four seasons fit into that beautifully, as do uh, hours of the day and uh, all sorts of other things, you know, elements like metal, water, wood, and so on. Um, but in modern day Japan, I don't know of any way in which seasons correlate with superstition. But um, seasons are terribly important in, in Japan, and uh, you see it in geisha culture, especially by. Uh, the changing of kimono and kimono design. Uh, in the spring, you wear one weight. And in fact, when I came back from my interviews with Mineko, I came back with a matrix that I made up that um, explained, you know, on uh, July 1st, you change uh, this item of clothing to this weight, and certain designs are typical, and the other items to the other weights, and so on. And every month, um, something would change. And I had this matrix, so I, when it came time to write a a scene, I would first have to figure out, all right, where are we here? Let's see, all right, it's May. And um, so I would, I would get my matrix out and come up with a kimono, uh, which takes a long time to describe something like that. I would pace around my study, banging my head. And then um, it turns out that a copy editor is basically your worst English teacher nightmare. 
And the copy editor's job is to go through and say, well, now, you said it was May, but if I figure out your chronology, it's clearly July. And so I would think, oh, you know, great. I've got to throw out all my kimono and start all <laughs> over. Which is exactly what I had to do. Seasons are terribly important. And this is something the costume designer has been struggling with in the film. How true to be to the chronology of the story, where there are also other considerations about kimono design uh, and the visuals of the film. Yes. Um, are you each working on original, or is someone in there that? I'm working on a um, magazine article for National Geographic that I hope will become a book. Um, it's on cultural notions of beauty around the world and um, uh, the science that's being done on it, the, uh, um, uh, the economics of the cosmetics industry, that sort of thing. I'm hoping, it'll, I'm hoping it will be a book. I um, have been doing so much traveling that I haven't gotten um, very far on my next book, but I have written um, chapter one. I mean, I wrote chapter one. You know. And then I spent the rest of the day saying, okay, let's see, bold face, no wait. Bo yeah, bold face, no wait. And that was a, that was a day, uh, and about as much work as I've gotten done on it. Um, writers are sort of funny about talking about their next projects. I don't know why. It's maybe it's like naming the baby beforehand. But I will say that this next novel of mine has absolutely nothing to do with Japan. And although I have um, thought it would be a blast to give a geisha a walk-on part in the novel, I, can't, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it because of the time period. <laughs> I think we're down to the sort of one, one or two more question. Yes. Do you speak fluent Japanese? Do I speak fluent Japanese? At the peak of my Japanese ability, which was in 1982 after I'd lived there, I, sp I would not have hesitated to put on my resume that I spoke fluent Japanese. <laughs> um, the truth was, you know, kind of one of those resume kind of things, you know? I, uh, I spoke it pretty well, but I didn't speak it with native fluency. I mean, I studied about four years of Japanese in school and lived there for 14 months. Now, since then, it's gotten pretty rusty, but it still works a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think, we're, I think we have to make this the last question. Does that sound right? Yes. Well, uh, you're going to university or work at Boston University. That's the big challenge that I was supposed to you. So what work in Japan? Oh, well. I um, did get an MA at Boston University, and I did teach creative writing there. Um, what I've been doing lately is teaching a course in narrative structure. I sort of go around, uh, I don't really go around doing it, but occasionally, I, I did it in San Francisco last weekend, in fact. Um, and, um, and that's all I'm teaching right now because I just don't have any more time. But that was such a short one. Let's take one more because we have two more oh, minutes. Okay. There's The question is, have the Japanese responded to my book? Has yours actually been translated in French? Um, no, but my, um, my geisha wrote me and said that she hasn't had a chance to read your book yet. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> but she's looking forward to it. Is it in Japanese? Well, it's being, uh, it's, my book is being translated into Japanese. And I'm playing actually quite an important role in the translation. The translator emails me with things like he says, um, now on page such and such, you say that she's uh, eating a rice ball wrapped in a lotus leaf. But I've never heard of such a thing. I think you must have meant a bamboo leaf. And so I email him back and say, uh, go for it. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the important role that I'm playing in the translation. And uh, the book will be coming out there at some point. I don't know when. And I don't have any idea what the reaction will be. But um, for a long time, I thought there might not be a reaction at all because of um, but the book would just sort of go, and that would be it. Nobody would notice it at all. But uh, there's quite a heightened awareness of it because of, um, because of Spielberg. People do follow him pretty closely. So uh, now I think the book will get a reception, but I can't predict what that reception will be. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening. 
For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.